Welcome to Good Tech, Compassionate Healthcare, an AMS healthcare podcast that explores the convergence of technology and compassion in healthcare. We host conversations between leading researchers, scientists, and healthcare providers as they confront the challenges threatening our current and future healthcare system, especially in the face of the pandemic. We see an incredible opportunity for digital health to innovate medicine and clinical care, healthcare education, home care, and beyond. That said, we hope to foster an open-ended discussion about how to integrate technology into the healthcare system in a way that enhances and doesn't diminish compassionate care. Ultimately, improving the experience of patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers alike. If there was ever a time to uphold compassion as the bedrock and guiding principle of healthcare, it's now. Join us now to explore Good Tech, Compassionate Healthcare, brought to you by AMS Healthcare. In this conversation, Morag Patton, a researcher in higher education at the University of Toronto, and physician and medical educator Ayelet Cooper discuss compassion, equity, and moral courage, and reflect on lessons from COVID. Hi, my name is Ayelet Cooper. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am a physician who practices general internal medicine at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. And I'm also a scientist and an associate director at the Wilson Center for Research and Education. I am a former AMS Phoenix fellow, and I am a member of faculty at the Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, and an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Hi, my name is Morag Payton. I have the pronoun she, her, and hers as well. I'm a PhD candidate in higher education in OISE, in the Education Institute at the University of Toronto. I'm a staff research coordinator in the Temerty Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. I'm also a parent of two kids. I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, I'm a daughter-in-law, I'm a sister, and these all come into play when we're talking about what we're talking about today, which is around equity and compassion and technology. From my perspective as a doctor who's been interested in equity and social justice work related to medicine and the health professions and education in the health professions for a while now, these topics like technology, equity, and compassion and how they relate to each other are things we've been talking about for years. These are things that you and I have written about, we have a book chapter together about, we have other papers about, we've worked on separately, and yet COVID seems to have made everything more obvious. All of a sudden, the people I know who were doing this work before are feeling, wow, people are actually understanding and noticing all these problems that we've been yelling you know, into the wind about for years. And people who maybe had some idea have gotten emboldened to think about it. And people who had never really thought about these issues before are getting worried or excited about them. We're starting to talk about them. And in a way, that's an amazing opportunity because more people are interested in social justice. But in a way, it's really sad or frustrating because we knew that these things were problems. And now we're seeing them, all the terrible things that can happen when these things play out, when we have limited resources and when we see all the different flaws that have sort of led us to a real problem in society. I've been thinking, as you said, we've been talking about this and writing about this together for a while. And really, as somebody who wasn't part of my sort of a, as a formal introduction, like I immigrated to Canada when I was young. I am white. I'm married. I have a full-time, well-paying job with very secure sort of pension benefits. And I think that there's a lot of privileges that I have that I've been thinking about a lot in the last year in particular. About a year ago, COVID was starting to rage, I guess, in Toronto. 
My father-in-law, he's in his 80s and he gets regular dialysis in one of the hospitals here in the city. And at the time, it just seemed like COVID was like a death sentence for people his age and in his condition. My mother-in-law called us one day to let us know he had a fever. And over the next few days, the situation just seemed to get increasingly worse. There was a confirmed COVID outbreak in the dialysis ward, which I discovered through going to their website. There was confirmed contact with a COVID positive patient. He was sent for a COVID test on his way into dialysis. And we were kind of just waiting for the results. At the time, it was taking a little while for those to come in. And then his symptoms just started to change. My mother-in-law would call us and say, he's got a fever. And then he was okay a few hours later. And then he was confused. And then he had a fall. And then he was fine again and then confused again. We were scared and we couldn't go over there because of the restrictions in place. We didn't want to infect them or he was going to the hospital three times a week. It was pretty scary. So I went to technology at the time and the internet and we went through the hospital symptom checkers. I am not a health expert. I am not a physician, but I can access the internet when I need to. So I went through the hospital symptom checkers and every time we did that, the algorithm would spit out call 911. And it took us two days to convince my mother-in-law to do that against the wishes of her husband, who didn't want to go to the hospital and didn't think he had COVID. And he went only really reluctantly once the paramedics arrived. And he spent two weeks in the hospital. And as soon as we entered, from the really rush of the days proceeding and the panic and the rising anxiety and everything, things seemed to immediately just fall silent. So my mother-in-law's hearing aid literally wasn't actually working properly at the time. She couldn't go to get it fixed. And if she did get a call from her husband's doctor, she couldn't always hear what they were saying. And she was becoming increasingly distressed. And we couldn't go to her, as I was saying, and she was unable to go to the hospital. And again, I used technology. And here I used a different technology that a lot of people have. I used the connections I had as a student, as a staff member at the university. So I reached out to you and members of my the grad school lab. About this time last year, we stopped meeting regularly um, in person and we started using WhatsApp for chats and just to check in on each other and to make sure everyone was okay. So I reached out to that group um, on WhatsApp and asked for advice. I yell at you and other members of the lab who were actively treating patients with COVID, helped me ask the right questions. I was to pose during my phone calls. I had like a script. I was supposed to call the hospital and ask a specific question and find the right person to talk to. And that was a huge privilege that I had. And through their help, I found out who the physician was. And it was somebody that I had worked with in the past. And um, you texted him. And within a few hours, this is about a week and a half into my father-in-law's stay at the hospital. Basically, a week and a half of not really knowing what was going on. Within a few hours of that text, my mother-in-law had received a phone call from that physician and they then called us. I knew him to be a really caring doctor, a caring person, a caring human being. And after a week and a half of really not knowing what was going on, we suddenly knew a lot more. And also what wasn't said in that call was compassion I knew my father-in-law had actually been receiving for the last week and a half in the hospital, which we hadn't seen and we didn't feel as people stuck at home, really. Here, you know, we're talking about compassion and technology. Here's a pretty clear intersect with compassion and technology. Technology enabled us to actually understand that there had been compassion all along, and yet technology also disrupted the ability to feel that compassion for the week and a half. We were limited as to what information we could access. My father-in-law is fine now. He's back at home. He ended up having two COVID, negative COVID tests, and he actually barely remembers the two weeks he spent in the hospital. The rest of us don't forget anything that happened in those two weeks. <laughs> it was just pretty difficult. And I think about all of the families that have had to go through similar things in the last year. And as we've been talking about compassion for me, and you know, I've been working in the healthcare space been working in the faculty of medicine now for 15 years. And I have thankfully had very limited experience actually being a patient or even as a family member of somebody who's sort of in that healthcare space. We talk about COVID making everything more obvious. This was one of the few and one of the first sort of things that I've had to encounter in my life that has affected me in such a way. It's limited, you know, I'm sure many of us, we've never lived through a pandemic before. Stuck at home, our kids are at home. All of those things that we've been writing about and I've been maybe theorizing about have suddenly become real. You know, Marg, it strikes me as I'm listening to you that I couldn't help myself. I was writing down all the different technologies 
that maybe we don't even notice our technology and maybe we don't even notice that not all of us have access to or not everyone everywhere has access to. So you started with talking about dialysis, which is a technology in Toronto, at least everyone who needs, I think, has access to, although hard to access in parts, certain parts of the country, hard to access certainly in many countries in the world. Then you talked about the hospital website. You know, there are people who couldn't do that, whether because they don't have internet access, they don't have the devices, they don't know how to do that. They don't speak English, whatever it is. You talked about calling your family and it made me think about the different kinds of phones and different things that people have access to on their phones. Reminded me about the COVID app. Do you remember that when the COVID app was rolled out and all these people realized that only sort of more advanced phones, more recent phones can download the COVID app. I upgrade my phone pretty regularly. And my phone was like, I think the oldest to put on a COVID app. And that's just because I don't like buying a phone unless I go to the Apple store. And the Apple store has essentially been closed to walk-ins for a year. So I haven't upgraded my phone. We talked about COVID tests. That's a technology, all different kinds of technology, all different kinds of tests. There are tests you can now access in Toronto that are faster, slower, free, not free. In my neighborhood, like I live in a neighborhood full of doctors of you know pretty high socioeconomic status, a doctor married to a doctor. In my neighborhood, you can walk into a storefront not far from me and pay 50 bucks and get a rapid COVID test back in 30 minutes. Really? Yeah. Wow. Someone set it up. It's private. I don't know exactly why or how, but it exists. Lots of people I know bring their kids there if something happens related to school, right? Then you talked about the internet symptom checker. You talked about the 911 system and the paramedics. You talked about your mom's hearing aid, how that piece of broken technology may have broke all communication. Because it may be that, you know, people were calling, they just, she couldn't understand them. And she speaks English, she's cognitively intact, but her technology was broken. You talked about calling the doctor, you talked about texting, you talked about our WhatsApp group that really, I think, kept us, kept me going when we were in quarantine too, kept all those things going. And then the other technology and the technology that I think is in the news more than any technology right now, because as you said, we're talking in April, 2021, is the vaccine or the vaccines and all the technologies that none of us knew anything about a year and a half ago. mRNA vaccine technology and how we've all become suddenly experts in what it is and how it works. They're all aspects of technology that intersect with COVID and that intersect with equity and that intersect with the, our ability to provide compassionate care. And so these all tie together, except for the hearing aid, which presumably you've gotten fixed by now. Or, got, or just ordered a new one. These are all technologies on which you were sitting on the access side. So there was a little bit of a hiccup because there was lack of access. And then all of a sudden access again. But otherwise, your father-in-law would have come home. And as I remember the story, because I remember living through it with you, you may never have known if he had COVID or not, because he couldn't tell you if he had been diagnosed with COVID or not, because he didn't understand because he was so sick what was going on. So you might never know. It's interesting because at one point there was another technology that became available, which was he could have been tested after the fact. And now he's been vaccinated. He's been vaccinated, yes, now using new technologies. One of the things we've been talking about is things that I had access to that many people didn't. We've written about and we've talked about this sort of triangle, that it's not just technology and compassion and one serving the other into the healthcare system, how technology can enable compassion. But there's a third part of that triangle, and that's equity. And we've been touching on it all along, but I think it's really helpful to understand that it is a triangle. There isn't something in the middle. There's compassion and compassionate care. There's technology on one side of that triangle, and then there's an equity, and that holds everything in tension. So when I think about vaccines as technology, which is never how I've ever thought about vaccines before, but absolutely, I think of technology as my iPhone or my laptop or how I'm connecting with you all today. If we think about vaccines as technology, we can also think about them, if we think about them as preventative compassionate care. The idea that the technology of vaccines and the enabling of compassion and compassionate care could be served through an equitable framework. My father-in-law has received two doses of the vaccine now. He's fully vaccinated. 
He's the only person I know outside of healthcare workers who have been fully vaccinated. Myself and most of the people I know have yet to receive one dose. I think that maybe talk a little bit more about that because you have such a unique insight into this as somebody who can theorize around this, but also lives it every single day as a parent, as a physician, as somebody who sort of guides our lab through this, you know, and I hadn't have guided our grad school lab through this year as well. I've been thinking a lot as the province has been hurtling towards more COVID in wave three about the difference between last year and this year. And it strikes me that last year, I remember going up to the hospital and being terrified of getting COVID and bringing COVID home. My husband was working with COVID patients as well. He's a little bit older than me, worrying that he was going to get sick, worrying that we would get, we had to continue to have childcare during the pandemic because we were both working clinically. So we would get our childcare workers sick, but going to work and knowing that what we could bring to patients that we saw in this difficult time when they were all freaked out, even the ones who had nothing to do with having COVID, you know, they had a normal medical problem, a kidney infection, a lung infection that wasn't COVID, heart failure, you know, normal things that would bring people into hospital. But suddenly they were by themselves. They were terrified. So many of my patients are confused and delirious and not having that person there to reorient them who they know is just terrifying for them. What we could bring to them is love and compassion. And I've written about this before for AMS and in other settings about how I talk to my students about doing that. And it seemed more important than ever. And the students actually even seemed receptive to it in some ways more than ever. There was so much feeling for these patients and trying to, you know, the phone calls to the families and can we get someone with an iPad? And everyone really felt that what they had to bring for many of these patients was compassion in a way that I think hadn't been brought to the fore previously because, you know, the families would be there and we wouldn't think about it too much and we would just chat with them. And and now it had to be intentional. You may remember, Morag, that when Ariel Lefkowitz, who was in our lab, still is in our lab, but he at the time was just finishing up his master's with me, published that piece in Toronto Life about working on the COVID ward and how he said, you know, he took it over from our boss who had been the doc on the week before. And this was when we first had a COVID ward And he's like, well, what do I need to do? Like, what do I need to know about these patients? And our boss was just like, be kind to them, be compassionate, treat them like human beings. And you know how to do that. You're good at that. That There's not much else you can do for them right now. Just bring them compassion. You know, those patients were so terrified. They were so terrified of making the doctors and nurses sick that they would like shoo the doctors and nurses out of the room. The ones who were sort of young or cognitively intact enough to sort of know what was going on or were confused from their illness. And that was what we had to give. And even though it was terrifying, it was meaningful. And now we have this drug and that drug and the other drug, and we have things that we know are effective and we have high flow oxygen and antibodies and some of the drugs we don't have because we've run out of stock of them in our hospital or in the city or in the province. And so you start getting upset because you know you have treatments you can offer and you don't have them, you can't give it, or you can only give it to two out of six because you only got two doses left. And you're seeing people who you know, if they had been vaccinated when you were vaccinated, because we're all vaccinated now, the frontline doctors and everyone who, basically everyone who works full-time in the hospital or or clinically in the hospital is vaccinated now if they want to be. If they were vaccinated when you were, they wouldn't be sick. And it's not that you don't want to give them compassion. You still have compassion for them. You still feel terrible for them. In some ways you feel worse for them because you feel guilty too. That inequity piece, because that's what we're seeing on the front line of who is sick, what postal codes and what jobs and what positions Mm -hmm. in society, that inequity piece is making that compassion, even though I'm confident that my colleagues are still enacting it, hurt so much is making it so much more morally fraught and painful. And I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it in people who are exhausted, who are now burning out faster than ever. 
And it was so much easier when we didn't have the technology to not worry about the inequity because someone had to go out and do it. And we had to have someone in the grocery store and no one was protected. But now that we know that we can protect some people, that's where the inequity of technology becomes so visible in your face, obvious. As a healthcare provider, it makes me angry. As a frontline worker, it doesn't mitigate the compassion and care I need to provide, although sometimes it makes it psychologically harder. But as a advocate, sometimes you just hope that something is just so obvious that it will open people's eyes. If you find this conversation interesting, check out the AMS Healthcare best-selling book, Without Compassion, There Is No Healthcare, where 28 outstanding Canadian healthcare leaders confront the challenges threatening our healthcare system. Find it wherever you buy your books. Now back to our conversation. Over the last few years, locally at least, and I think at many schools across the country, people have started to bring information about social justice, social justice advocacy concepts to medical schools, to nurse, they've actually been in nursing schools, I think for quite a long time. The social work schools, many of them have been teaching this for a long time, but there's a power and a hierarchy. And we all know that if the doctors aren't doing it, it tends not to be considered as legitimate. Look, who, look who's sitting at the vaccine rollout table. It's not pharmacists, nurses, and family docs who actually do all the vaccinating normally. It's like super specialist doctors and non-physicians, non-healthcare workers. We know who needs to have that voice. And so when doctors are being trained to have that voice, and right now I think often are being trained just to know about certain facts about inequities, but the more we train people to be able to think about these things, the more I am hopeful that it will permeate into the doctors who do public health work, that it will permeate into the ones who end up as assistant deputy ministers or the ones who end up in politics or the ones who end up having that voice to speak about healthcare in the public in a way that can make change. And so I'm, I am hopeful that maybe this is a moment because I see that happening in our own faculty where equity for excellence has become you know, the part of our strategic mission, that this has really galvanized people into being like, this is actually life or death day to day important for people. And that it's all well and good to talk about providing compassionate care. But, you know, Morag, you may remember back in November, we were talking in our lab quite a bit about a teaching session that one of our lab mates was running on moral courage. Right? He was talking about lessons from the Holocaust for physicians and why it's relevant. And I think we talked then about how the Lancet had come out with a statement and had created a commission on learning from the Holocaust because so much of the architecture of the Holocaust was carried out by doctors and engineered by doctors who felt that they were doing it as part of their duty as doctors to cut human cancers out of the system, the body politic. And so because of that, we now teach, last year was the first time we've done this, we use it as an example of a time when doctors didn't show moral courage and the individual doctors who did and how to learn from that, how to take those lessons and enact those moments of moral courage. And we talked, we have another member of our lab actually went and talked about work he does in the LGBTQ community based on his moral beliefs that he is obliged to do so as a doctor who has power and knowledge. And, you know, I've seen some of that come forward in the pandemic. I've seen some physicians who've stood up, some people who've lost their jobs, as we've seen very publicly, or lost their promotions or their positions. Some people who I'm sure are under a lot of political pressure, who have anyway gotten up and done what's right and closed schools or done whatever needs to be done. And we've seen other people who have just gotten along. And I think that ways in which we can transform people to understand that their job requires moral courage, 
that the ethic of being a doctor, of having that power and privilege, or I might say being anybody else who has power and privilege, but I can't speak to what politicians should be taught, is to have moral courage and to do what's right and not just what's most expedient. As somebody who is not a doctor, I would think that a lot of us could learn in the same lesson. I think there's a lot of people in, in lots of different roles. And I think that there must be a lot of people who are going into their jobs who wish they had moral courage or wish others around them who have the power to change things. People are going into jobs and they feel unsafe right now. And I think that's a really good lesson. So for those people, even if you don't have to be a doctor to speak up for somebody's health, No, but it is a different thing to expect someone who is a minimum wage worker, who if they lose their job would be at risk of losing their housing, who if to speak up for themselves and their colleagues at their delivery company or packing plant, that's a level of courage that is involves an enormous amount of risk. Whereas for a doctor to speak out, you know, even the doctors who've lost their jobs, what they've done is they've lost their leadership positions. No one's starving. No one's going to starve. No one's not going to be able to make a living. No one's going to have, you know, you might have a career repercussion, although someone else will probably hire you somewhere else. But you're not going to, in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you're not going to have any problems. I think that's part of where it behooves certain people to say, the risk I am taking versus the help that I can give Yes, the doctors we were talking about in that lecture about the Holocaust, yes, some of them were risking their lives, for sure. But I'm not asking frontline workers to risk their lives and their livelihoods. I don't feel like I have the ability to do that. I'm asking my own colleagues to stand up for what's right. And so many of my colleagues are doing so. All the frontline people who are working so hard are doing so. I want to know how we teach our students to do what I see my colleagues doing, because I think my colleagues are doing it every day in droves. How do we sustain that? And how do we keep it so that the next generation of doctors understands that this is their job? The problem is that even though I have all of these amazing, courageous colleagues, no one is listening to them. Even some of our local medical officers of health who are amazing and courageous and advocating for the things they see in local communities, the people who are out there advocating for the vaccine clinics, the people who are out there advocating for LTC justice, the people who are out there advocating for a hundred different things that we need to fix to fix this pandemic and to fix the healthcare system. The problem at the other end is there has to be someone who's willing to listen. And there have to be people who are willing to acknowledge that the combination of frontline experience and in-depth expertise that these people bring and their ability and willingness to say things, not because they're popular, but because they're true and because they are dangerous if they're not addressed. Two months ago, people stood up and said, if we don't do X, Y, and Z, our ICUs are going to be overwhelmed in April. I heard 20 different expert doctors and I know say the same thing. I've sat at meeting after meeting where amazing, amazing, courageous people have talked about this. People who haven't slept in a year. People who miss their kids' birthdays and their parents' birthdays. They miss their kids' birthdays because they're working. They miss their parents' birthdays because they can't see them. I would let their entire academic careers fall apart just in order to just do this because it's important. And no one listened. And that piece doctors can't fix on their own. That piece requires the public and people who vote, doctors vote, but there aren't that many of us. That piece requires acknowledgement, and this is maybe a problem we have in the 21st century, that there actually is expertise based in knowledge and based in training and based in fact and not based in wishful thinking. And hopefully Ontario and Canada can come back to a place where that's a bit better in balance. Otherwise, all their moral courage will go to waste. I'm so thankful we've had this conversation because what you've just expressed, 
I couldn't have possibly heard it say better. Um, and I really appreciate the thought and the consideration you have with your colleagues who are working so hard because I see it as well. And I'm thankful for the people that I see with those positions of power that are really speaking out, speaking about the truth about what's happening out there. I started talking at the very beginning of this around my father-in-law and, you know, we've come through a quite a long conversation about compassion and technology and my optimism, which is still there based on what you've just said. It's still there. Those people are still there. So I just, you know, I want to thank you and also thank you for the work that you do as, as a physician and as somebody who sort of leads our small lab. It's been a joy working with you, really. And it's, it's fun writing with you. But also, I think that we're helping change people's perspectives, or at least, if not change, give them a, another perspective from which to view the world from. And I should thank you because you push me in my thinking and in my certainties and in my assumptions. I, I can't stick to an assumption because I know it will get pushed and I know I will be made to think about why I have it and why it perhaps should be differently and how the world would be different if it wasn't so. You know, I can see there are reasons for your optimism. I can see some organizations that I would have thought would be more anxious to be in line with, for example, government policy that are supporting their physician leaders for speaking out. I see several hospitals where physician leaders are speaking out absolutely fearlessly with the support, understanding of their leadership rather than concern about government funding or other things like that. I see institutions that are pushing us forward. And so I can only hope that we will come into better balance. Thanks for joining us for our conversation, Compassion, Equity and Moral Courage, Reflecting Lessons from COVID. And a big thank you to Morag Patton and Ayelet Cooper. Join AMS Healthcare next time for teaching compassion in digital healthcare, a moving conversation between healthcare educators and their students on the challenges they are facing when teaching and learning compassion in the face of the pandemic. Check out our series on the Healthy Debate website, Without Compassion There Is No Healthcare. And please join the conversation next time on Good Tech, Compassionate Healthcare. AMS works to advance a Canadian healthcare system through innovation and technology while remaining rooted in compassion and our medical history. They convene networks, develop leaders, and fund crucial activities in medical history, healthcare research, education, and clinical practice. Their work helps improve care for all Canadians. For more information, visit amshealthcare.ca to access their wealth of resources and view their funding opportunities. AMS Healthcare has recently published a best-selling book, Without Compassion, There Is No Healthcare, available wherever you buy your books. A series of articles based on this book are available on healthydebate.ca. This podcast was produced by Michael McDonnell, music by Carlo Cruz.